Hi, good evening everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, you'll have to forgive the strange surroundings. I am, um, and there's probably not great lighting, but I'm on the road for a week and um, sometimes you just have to sit down where you are and <laughs> make the most of it. So this evening I want to, well this evening, I'm recording this on Wednesday, uh, you'll watch it on Thursday when I will be in Swansea. Um, so I've had quite a few things to do around the country this week. Uh, and tomorrow is Swansea. I'll be in Swansea all day tomorrow. So all day Thursday. So I'll be probably driving when you're watching this. Saturday I'm in London, Sunday in Hertfordshire, and then I'm back up to Hartley Pearl. So things will be back to normal next week. So this evening I want to do a book review. And before I do, I want to just explain a little bit about the book reviews. The reasons that I do these are to recommend, uh, if I read, I read a lot and I read an interesting book that I think contains information that people ought to know. Uh, I will recommend that they read this book. Um, and also I think you'd be, as members, supporters, you'd be really interested in these issues. Lawfully, I'm obviously not allowed to sit here and read a book to you because that would be, uh, if I read you a book then there would be no point in you going out and buying the book and that would be unfair on the author and while my copyright law was sort of began and ended in law school uh, I'm aware of the fact that I'm not able to sit here and read you a full book but I can read sections from it for the purpose of education which is of course what this is. Uh, and fundamentally to recommend that people read the book because they will find important information within it. So the book this evening is The Great Charity Scandal. What really happens to the billions we give to good causes? And it's by David Craig. And it is a, it's a, it's a short book, so it's a nice fast read. And it is filled with really interesting and really important information about how our money is spent. Now I give to charities, I give to animal charities actually mostly, um, and I give to small charities and I give to the big charities. The charity I've probably supported longest, well I've, I, there's, another, there's a vivisection charity I've supported since I was a child, but the big charity um, that I've supported longest is the RSPCA. And Regardless of the criticisms that they receive, I also know that they rescue thousands of dogs every year. And if they didn't rescue all those dogs every year, well, I suspect nobody would. So that's the reason I continue to support the RSPCA and other um, large ish, but mostly the, the charities that you know a uh, little less about. Flora and Fauna, for example, is one. Um, that I support. I support a uh, particular protection for, uh, uh, I support and I contribute to the pay, the salary, the wages of poachers who protect elephants in Kenya. Um, and that's probably one of my favourite um, charities. So I am someone who gives to charity. Um, I'm also someone who has volunteered in charities over the years. Um, and yeah, I, 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 you know, I support, I support charities, but I do think that people would care about what is written in this book. Um, the chapters I'll tell you about first, and these are, there's one that explains what charity is, that's chapter one. Uh, there's a chapter about how much, and this is a controversial um, topic. I'm not going to read from this chapter, but I'll tell you about it. You pay peanuts, you get monkeys. And that was a quote from The Guardian about the high salaries that chief executives, for example, in a lot of the big charities take home. And this is an issue that comes up every now and then, and everyone is appalled, and, and there's something must be done, and you get your usual stuff, uh, and nothing changes. But I am going to uh, read to you, particularly from two sections. You Pay Peanuts is a really fascinating one. Do have a look at that. It'll tell you figures of what, what the big charity bosses are paid. 
Fundraising Fun is chapter four. That's about what's known as chuggers and about the agencies. The chuggers are the people with the, the little shaking tin or they will come up to you in the high street with a clipboard and a pen and ask you for your bank details and, and uh, tell you how they're saving all these poor sad um, uh, fighting all these terrible things and want your bank details off you straight away and there's been controversy over the years about how aggressive they are and local council some local council have taken action against them uh, as they've been made, making people uncomfortable but you, you have a, having a read of that um, will tell you how much money agencies get agencies who supply who supply the chuggers so there's a lot of middlemen there's a lot of different organizations involved a lot of expenses and in many cases it's actually only a rather a smaller percentage than its donors i suggest um realize that actually go for the fundamental charitable cause that the group is uh, represents it whatever charity uh, whatever they actually do to help people is actually a, a much smaller percentage of your money than you might think okay so I'm going to take you through some of uh, chapter 5 which is playing politics and this one is won't come as any surprise to anyone but let me read just apart from it in the middle of June 2014, there was a major outbreak of hostilities. This was not in the Ukraine nor in Iraq. This was in Britain, and it was between the charity sector and its supporters on one side and the Conservative Party on the other. The flashpoint seems to have been the publication by Oxfam of a report titled The Perfect Storm, Economic Stagnation, the Rising Cost of Living, Public Spending Cuts, and the impact on UK poverty. In its report, Oxfam made a number of claims which understandably somewhat upset the Tories. For example, Oxfam wrote, the economy is stagnating, unemployment, unemployment is increasing, prices are rising, incomes are falling, and spending on public services is being cut back rapidly. In addition, the Oxfam report threw out some fairly spine-chilling statistics. 13.5 million people live in poverty in Britain. The UK is one of the most unequal rich countries in the world. 5.5 million UK households are affected by fuel poverty. The UK has weaker protection for those in work than Mexico, and so on. Oxfam accompanied its report with a tweet mocked up film poster. Several times I've asked Oxfam for permission to include a copy of its poster and tweet in my book and each time Oxfam has refused. So I'll have to describe the mocked up film poster as I'm not allowed to show it. The poster depicted a rough foaming tempestuous sea under a dark gloomy threatening sky and the film title The Perfect Storm. Underneath the title was the text Zero Hour Contracts, High Prices, Benefit Cuts, Unemployment, Childcare costs. Some people might wonder why Oxfam seems to have, do have adopted a fairly low profile when unemployment shot up by a shocking 55% from 1.62 million to 2.51 million from 2007 to 2010 under new labour while energy and food prices also rocketed. Yet Oxfam launched its campaign against poverty in the UK while unemployment was falling by 17% from 2.51 million to 2.08 million under the coalition. And in spite of Oxfam's and the government's claims of public spending cuts, public spending was still rising inexorably. So that's just part. So what 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 do you what have you learned what have we learned immediately, immediately from that? is that the charity, certainly this charity, is politically biased. Because at the time when the economic situation was worse under Labour, no such report was published by Oxfam. When things are actually improving under the Conservatives, Oxfam comes out with this report condemning the Conservative government while being silent on a worse performing Labour government. So what are we being told? We're being told that charity politically biased towards the left and it should come with as absolutely no surprise at all 
because it seems that the entire no, it, it's like the public sector, the education sector, the charity sector, the media, all all biased in favour of the left, and charities are no different. We can see that immediately uh, with a fairly standard example. Let me give you a couple more. A few pages down, headline, Politics or Us. Many other charities have also been tempted away from their main focus on relieving suffering into campaigning to change attitudes and the law. Christian aid has been criticised for bias in favour of the Palestinians and against the Israelis. Once again, standard left-wing stuff. And there's no reason, there's no reason for Christian aid to be to express bias in favour of Palestinians and against Israelis. I'm not sure why that's their role. It goes on to say, moreover, in 2013, Christian Aid staff joined with ACT Alliance and other global partners at the United Nations Rio Plus 20 Summit in Brazil to lobby the UK government on sustainable energy, clamping down on tax avoidance and the concept of a green economy. Also in 2013, Christian Aid sent its tax justice bus around the country. By the end of its 53-day tour of Britain and Ireland, more than 5,000 people, including 56 MPs, had climbed aboard to hear how tax dodging hurts people both here at home and in the world's poorest countries. During the tour, 10,000 people signed the Tick for Tax Justice action cards, which called on Prime Minister David Cameron to use his global leadership to tackle tax dodging. Many donors to Christian Aid might be surprised to learn that their money was being used to campaign supposed global warming or climate change or whatever it's called by the time this book is published to to campaign for a higher planet saving green taxes or energy bills and to avoid and to pay for a touring bus demanding a clampdown on tax avoidance. Many donors may indeed wonder. But again the it's obvious. It's obvious the bias in favour of left-wing causes is absolutely obvious. Uh, he goes on to say the much-loved Save the Children also got slightly burned when it tried its hand at politics. It had launched a TV ad uh, with actors in it. Again, uh, you wonder what, uh, how much money is actually being uh, paid out Another aspect that he addresses is the issue of fake charities. And that's what he calls uh, uh, charities which do not actually receive a great deal of public funding, but instead government funding. And you have to wonder, and the question, one of the questions he raises in this book is why, if they are not supported by the public to the point where the public is willing to donate directly to them, why are they being supported by the public indirectly through taxation? So the public are essentially being forced to support charities that they don't support independently and they don't support without, uh, the, without doing so indirectly through their taxes. And charities do receive millions, millions upon millions of pounds in taxpayers' money um, while raising very little independently, and you do have to wonder why that is. Also, the number of charities. There are hundreds of thousands of charities in this country. I kid you not, hundreds of thousands of them. Okay. Back to some of the politics. And moving on in the book. Britain's charities haven't always been so politically politically active. Prior to the arrival of New Labour, any form of political lobbying by a charity or campaigning to have laws changed could only be incidental or ancillary to its charitable purpose and could not be a charity's dominant activity. But in 2002, the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit advocated a loosening of the rules because charities perform a valuable role in campaigning for social change. The strategy unit proposed the guidelines on campaigning should be revised to encourage charities to play this role to the fullest extent. 
Sure enough, in 2004, an obedient charity commission changed its rules to allow charities to engage in non-party political campaigning, provided this activity was not the dominant method, method by which the organisation will pursue its apparently charitable objects. Um, quite, uh, in, uh, quite unsurprising yet again that this happened under Tony Blair. So many awful things happened under Tony Blair, uh, like the opening of the borders, for example, the introduction of political correctness, the introduction of, of fearfulness, the introduction of hate speech laws, uh, and other uh, divisive and fracturing um, policies and, and mindsets. But yes, I mean, it, it happened under Tony Blair. Well, well, unsurprisingly, because knowing full well, knowing full well that if charities were able to campaign politically, while they may not be able to be obviously and overtly party aligned, it's pretty obvious that when they bring out, when Ox Oxfam brings out a report under the Tory government, when actually the economic situation was improving, it stayed silent under a Labour government. This is what they were always going to do. And you will have groups, and we have had groups like uh, various different charities, Hope Not Hate, um, various different groups who are registered in various different ways but are absolutely engaged in political activism and political campaigning. And it is in with the left, with promotion of left wing ideals in mind. Also within this book, and I'm going to, I'll read, uh, I'll read just a little bit of this to you, um, but I won't give it all to you because for, um, for the reasons I explained at the top. Okay, so we're, we're moving forward a little bit beyond the Labour government, the, the uh, Blair Brown Labour years to the coalition years. So it, he reads, he writes, Possibly concerned by the growing extent of political campaigning by charities and other bodies, in January 2014, the coalition introduced the Transparency of Lobbying, Non-Party Campaigning and Trade Union Administration Bill. The aims of the bill were quite modest. It only required that in the short period from the dissolution of Parliament up to the general election, campaigning groups should register their spending with the Electoral Commission if it exceeded more than £450,000 across the whole of the UK, or more than 9,750 in any single constituency. The 450,000 was a reduction from the previous level of 988,000. These proposals were met with howls of anguished fury by many charities and their apologists. One called the bill the charity gagging bill and said it would have a chilling effect on democracy. No. What has a chilling effect on democracy is charities that the public believes because they are those charities are presented to us as concerned for the thing they focus on, for the issue they focus on. So if it's a poverty charity, we believe, the public believes, that they are concerned for charity and that they are politically unbiased, that their purpose is to fight uh, 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 Char uh, poverty there is to use by charitable means to raise money through a registered charity an operating charity to fight poverty um, and that they will do that fairly and across the board with whichever government happens to be in power this is what people expect and charities are invited on to television and to news programs and current affairs programs in that guise that they are presenting a objective analysis of a particular issue, for example, poverty. So why they would howl in fury at simply uh, having their spending reduced during the campaign period, which is a short period, and call it a chilling effect on democracy, when the real chilling effect on democracy is that we are presented with something uh, that is we assume to be unbiased, but is actually itself engaging in political posturing and political campaigning for political parties. That's what's chilling, having a chilling effect on democracy because the people don't realise that these charities are party biased 
and they are, because they go after the Tories but stay silent about Labour. And we have groups like Christian Aid parroting left-wing causes, also the same causes that are parroted by Labour. Um, that's where the real chilling effect on democracy is. One thing I'd really, really recommend that you read from this is the salary increases across the public sector in the last couple of decades. They are absolutely, absolutely shocking. I want to move on to foreign aid, but I will, before I finish up, I wasn't going to, to give you these, um, again, for the reasons I said at the top of the thing, I can't give you too much of what this um, fantastic writer has put together. But I highly, highly recommend this book. It is filled with information that I think you will find very interesting. So let's move on to foreign aid and political correctness. Political correctness has truly, truly spoiled so much, hasn't it? It has ruined our free speech. It has ruined our, our politics. It has it, it ruined our politics in so many ways. It has destroyed our media because journalists can't get work if they're in any way objective. They have to, to toe the line. But political correctness is also the reason for the extraordinary high levels of foreign aid that we are giving away while our own people are struggling. So chapter six is uh, the chapter on foreign aid. I'll read you a small section of it. The poverty problem. When most people think of foreign aid, they tend to imagine brave aid workers rescuing people from earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, famines, and other such natural disasters. But this emergency aid accounts for an extremely small part of the foreign aid money we give either directly to charities or through our taxes to charities and various relief agencies. Perhaps just five to six billion of the 135 billion a year in foreign aid is emergency aid. The other 95% or so, 95 or so percent of charity and aid money goes to what's called development aid, helping, co helping countries escape from poverty and putting them on the path to development. In the last 60 years, around $3 trillion has been donated by developed countries to help poorer countries. There have been some successes. Extreme poverty has been more than halved. Diseases like river blindness and smallpox have all but been eradicated and millions of lives have been saved from famine and conflict. Moreover, many aid recipients have managed to break free from poverty and achieve rising levels of prosperity for their people. I'll move on a, a little bit. But while most formerly poor Asian and some South American countries have made significant progress on the road to development and modernization, too many countries, particularly in Africa, have stagnated or even become more impoverished over the last few decades in spite of being given more in aid than any other part of the world. So take the, that's the, the point made there is that despite that all the money, more money than any other part of the world is poured into Africa and despite that things are actually getting worse in Africa. In Europe, after the Second World War, the US-sponsored Marshall Plan is generally credited for helping war-ravaged European countries rebuild and become prosperous. So some people have demanded a Marshall Plan for Africa. There's only one problem with this demand. Africa has already had its Marshall Plan several times over. In the last 50 years, Africa has been given the equivalent of around 10 Marshall Plans. In today's money, the five-year European Marshall Plan saw about $100 billion, $20 billion a year, being used to rebuild Europe after World War II. In the last 50 years, Africa has received over $1 trillion in aid. So Africa received about the same every year, 20 billion a year, for 50 years that Europe received each year for just five years. Yet there's little evidence that those countries getting most aid have benefited from this aid and a quarter of sub-Saharan sub countries, including some of the world's recipients of most foreign aid, 
are now poorer than they were in 1960. Let me find where it talks in detail about corruption. We are essentially what he argues is that money is being spent, particularly in Africa, not even remotely on tackling poverty. Just, just not, a, just not a, a thing. Not a priority at all. It goes in to the pockets of warlords. It funds tribal wars. He goes in to great detail about the eye-watering levels of money that is going in to fight tribal wars in Africa and is going into the pockets of corrupt di uh, dictators, but also um, the what is the charity industry, the anti-poverty industry. And these people who work in this anti-poverty industry drive flashy Mercedes Benz. Uh, they, 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 Africa, uh, there's a name for them actually. A nickname um, which refers to the cars that are driven by those who are supposed to be fighting poverty but it is the corruption and he talks at, in some detail about why and how we're not actually allowed to talk about this corruption and why even though we know that money is going the vast vast bulk of the money is going to to buy weapons and to fight wars uh, and to, to keep in fact, many ways to keep poverty going. We don't require that the money is spent a certain way. And we don't require it because that would amount to neo-colonialism. That's what we would be accused of. Look at the white people telling the black people what to do with their money. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. But we are expected to hand over billions to these countries and we're not allowed to ask or require that money to be spent a certain way because that would be wait for it guess what you got it didn't you racist absolutely of course it would so we have to be happy be happy with all our taxes going into the pockets of warlords fighting bloody tribal wars all over Africa because a small percentage of the money we pay may feed someone hungry when the warlords have had their lion's share. So in order, we go along with this by the way, we allow this to happen and we allow, we also pay to allow aid to go into hostile countries. So they pay at the border, they bribe at the border. A large, large, if not most of the money is spent, your money is spent just bribing to get the stuff into inside the country in the first place. And we're okay with all this. The people in charge are okay with all this because it's the price we pay. We've got to spend billions just to get a small percentage through to people who are actually struggling and dying. And we have accepted the fact that the vast majority goes into the pockets of warlords. We know, we know this, and we still do it. And by the way, that's your money. That is your money. While you don't have a library or a community centre or the people, elderly people are living in shoddy care homes or, or disabled people are living on the breadline or kids living in poverty right here in this country, you have to be happy with the fact that your money instead of going to our pensioners, instead of going to our kids in poverty, is going in to the pockets of already wealthy warlords, is going to pay for weapons for African tribes to butcher each other. And you have to be okay with that because a little bit of the money might get through to the poor people in that country. That's foreign aid. Okay, one thing, one last thing I'm going to read uh, from this. But do get this book. It's, it's, it's really, really great. Um, the Population Explosion. He talks greatly, uh, he talks at great length at, uh, about the population of, and again, it's largely Africa. 
how can a he asks the question and it's a very valid question how can you reduce poverty in a country when it's a population is exploding and exploding and exploding you can't and this is why I have argued and have been ridiculously accused of supporting eugenics for this I have argued that we need a reduction in birth rates among in various parts of the world I'm not suggesting eugenics for crying out loud and I'm not suggesting sterilization either what I am suggesting is what Christopher Hitchens suggested which was access to contraception and the empowerment of women let women decide for themselves or at least have some say as Christopher Hitchens argued over how many children they have because I guarantee you the vast vast majority of women don't want to be pregnant every nine months they don't want to be raising child after child with barely enough to feed themselves and if women had any say in any of this those birth rates would not be so high and we would not have this poverty but because of religious and cultural attitudes that women are a walking uterus and that's that and and she must have child after child after child religious and cultural uh, uh, objections to any sort of of say by women cuts this thing down very sharply and you end up in a situation where people are just having baby after baby after baby and they already can't afford to feed themselves this is how you cure world poverty let women stop having babies when they want to stop having babies and I guarantee you most of them will he goes on to tell us some of the figures of this in 1984 the song do they know it's Christmas was released by Band Aid to raise money to help the starving uh, victims of the 83 to 85 Ethiopian famine the record plus the following years live aid concert raised around 150 million in 1965 18 years before the start of the famine the population of Ethiopia was about 25 million in 1984 it had passed 39 million today this is staggering today Ethiopia's population is around 96 million so during the 80s the famine of the 80s where live aid came from remember live aid um, the population of Ethiopia was 39 million today it's 96 million how on earth can we expect 150 million which is actually a pretty modest amount raised by the live aid concert how can that have any kind of impact in a country which population is growing that much that quickly the population problem is the problem um, other countries the same in 1965 the population of Somalia was 3 million today it's above 11 million in Sudan including South Sudan the 1965 population was 12 million today it's around 50 million here is our problem we need to bring down birth rates all over the world but you're not you know it's controversial even just to say it uh, because someone is going to accuse you of of something ridiculous like wanting sterilization or whatever it may be I do want to find just a couple of these uh, figures if I can as to um, the public sector pay increases um, now, are you, I'm probably going to, because I wasn't going to give you these, because um, like I said, I didn't want to give away too much of um, the fantastic information included in this book. Um, and you, wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, I'm not going to find it at this point without really irritating you and spending ages looking for it. You see, this is the problem with these things. This is what, one of the reasons I don't like reading on these things. Um, you, you, you can't mark pages. It's, it's really awkward. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. On my live stream next week, I'll go through and find some of the figures and talk about this a little bit. Um, so I won't spend too long rummaging through it this evening where are we 35 minutes okay okay so thoroughly thoroughly recommend that book to you uh, and you will find the most amazing information in there about where money goes and it's a difficult one because I I don't want um, people to 
I don't want people to not give to poverty or to, to charity. Um, but I, I, I also think we should know. I think people deserve to know. And this is an absolutely uh, brilliant, brilliant gathering together. Um, thoroughly detailed. Um, thoroughly detailed. Ah, okay, I found, I found it. <laughs> I found a little bit of what I wanted to read to you. Okay. Let's have, let me read to you a little bit of this. Again, I won't read it all because I, I could, uh, I will, it's unfair on the author. So just let me read you a little bit. In 2007, just before the financial collapse and the recession, there were in the region of 600 people in local councils being paid 100,000 a year or more, 64 people on 150,000 a year. And, and a couple of other figures, right? So on in 2007, we had, let's stick with the, there were 600 people in local councils being paid more than 100 grand a year. 600, yeah. By 2013, so what's that? 2017 to 2013, six years. After years, but yet by 2013, after years of supposed, we're all in this together, austerity, there were a more impressive, 2,181 people on 100,000 a year or more. So we went from 600 people in 2007 to 2,181 in the space of six years in the public sector being paid more than 100,000 pounds or more. The, over the same period, the average remuneration package of the 10 highest paid council executives jumped from 203,000 a year to above 270,000 a year, a rise of 33% during one of the worst recessions in British history. Once again, this is leftism. This is the fat cattery of the public sector that happens under left-wing governance. And, and I actually, I'm starting to include the Tories in left-wing governance at this point, because it continues. Yes, it all happened under New Labour, but it continues under the Tories. The Tories ought to be taking, to be you know, taking a grip on this. And I consider this to be wasteful public spending. I really do. Uh, and if we're going to get into the, I'm not suggesting that people in the public sector shouldn't be paid well. It depends, really. It depends on what they do. I think doctors and surgeons in the NHS for, and nurses in the NHS should be paid a lot more. Um, it really depends on the extent of their of their work and what they do, and how much they earn this. Um, and I'm not entirely convinced. Um, that everyone who earns 270k a year, for example, in the public sector, is contributing. Uh, if we if we look at um, local councils, for example, if they are doing a fantastic job for the local people, um, are they? Is the question. And you wonder how many, how much the local people are suffering, how many cuts the local people are being subjected to in order to pay this 270k uh, to a council executive. Stuff to make the blood boil, really, when you think about it. Fascinating, fascinating book. Highly recommended. As I say, nice short book. Um, nice easy read, easy read. Lots and lots of very interesting information in there. Okay, um, that's it for me for this evening. I shall be back in on uh my back in my my own room uh back to normal back to live streaming next week rest of the week i am in london speaking at a protest to remove the disgusting rapists from rochdale who have been deported they they should be out of the country by now should be out of the country by now and yet they're not out of the country by now and we want to know why and we want them out of the country so if you're in london or near london this saturday it's midday at parliament square jenny is making herself now so time to stop um see you back on my live stream on monday or 
If you're in London, see you on Saturday in London. Take care until then.